Welcome to the best show in North Central Arkansas, Health Connections. I'm your host, Tobias Pugsley. With me today, very special guest, our Director of Risk Management and Compliance, Cameron Lincoln. As soon as we come back, we're going to talk to Cameron and what he does on a daily basis. We're going to talk about advanced directives and the social topic that everybody's buzzing about, medical marijuana, all coming up right after this. Welcome back to Healthy Connections. Cameron, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So, Director of Risk Management and Compliance. The good folks out there watching the show um, probably have no idea what that is. So, do you mind uh, indulging us? I would love to, and don't worry too much, uh, you know, viewers of the show, because most people, I don't think, honestly know uh, what all that entails. So, Risk Management and Compliance, it's a... It's, it's a large grab bag of different stuff. So basically, I, I break it down into the two parts there. Compliance is a process by which basically all members of the healthcare community, specifically, you know, well, pretty much everybody from billing on up, uh, we're all involved in trying to prevent fraud and abuse, uh, reduce waste, uh, basically ensure the accurate and honest treatment of people, um, avoid unnecessary medical tests. It's essentially trying to fit all the things that we do um, under the regulatory framework that's currently overseen by about 40 different agencies, both state and federal, as well as statutory frameworks, and it's constantly changing. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of an ever-moving and shifting target, and part and parcel of that, and I, I think kind of my major duty where compliance is concerned is I manage the compliance program for the hospital, and a lot of different people are involved with that from multiple different departments through you know, reviewing policies or standards to auditing different processes to make sure that we're in compliance with the law, things like that. Then there's risk management, which I think of as being more abstract. <laughs> but risk management is essentially the process of reducing well, risks. And that can be everything from patient safety to healthcare outcomes. It could deal with uh, employee safety issues. It can deal with, um, of course, everybody's favorite, you know, litigation um, and, and dealing with sort of liabilities. So the two actually dovetail really well together, compliance and risk, since both are essentially trying to keep us on the right side of the law and keep us on, well, keep us where we want to be as an organization, uh, I think, for the betterment of both our institution and the patients who go there. And then, in addition to those, I also do patient privacy. I'm the HIPAA officer for the hospital, which means that I run our HIPAA program, um, which is mostly concerned with investigating any sort of uh, incidents where um, patient information has been, you know, mishandled or has you know, for whatever reason, made it into the wrong hands, or reducing any sort of likelihood of that, coming up with better practices to prevent that sort of thing. Um, sometimes it's just on-the-fly decision-making. Somebody says, hey, I want to do this, or I have a doctor's office asking us to do this, so they want a call to be made. They want somebody to review it and say, okay, that is or that isn't a HIPAA violation. Let's go with it. And I think that's the function most people are most familiar with me for is we call them up and say, hey, uh, I have this issue. What can I do to, like, how can I uh, address it? What should I do in this instance? And so I, I make myself available for that. Um, and lastly, I also assist our uh, general counsel, Nicole uh, Vaccarella, uh, as needed. So anytime some sort of uh, project comes up or there's something she needs me to help with, I'm kind of available to do that. So a lot of our viewers probably don't realize, but it actually takes a law degree to, to do that laundry list of... <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know that it does, but it sure doesn't hurt. Um, you know, there are compliance officers out there that do, are not attorneys. Um, it can be done uh, by individuals who uh, do not have one. I think that it would be hard. Um, it would be very difficult to do all three of those things without having kind of an understanding of how to read and interpret law, how to be able to research, you know, changes that have occurred, um, legally speaking. So I think it, it's certainly advantageous to have one, but I don't know that it would be necessarily required. And I, I have seen that 
I believe uh, the last I read, something like 60% of all healthcare compliance officers now are attorneys. So um, it's it's definitely helpful. Start, it's starting to move more towards that too, I assume. And I think the more um, healthcare stays in the minds of our legislatures out there, uh, I think that'll become more and more the case as time goes by. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're a local native. You grew up here. I did, yeah. Fa family here. Um, That's true. And uh, came back here. So tell us a little bit about how you, you came to get this position with Baxter Regional. Well, I think, uh, I, I hope Baxter agrees with me that we were both very lucky uh, with the timing on that. You know, I, uh, my wife, of course, is a physician in town, and I think that's probably where you're hitting at, too. I, I have other doctor family members in the town. Um, but we moved back here, of course, because family, and it's a really good place for a family medicine physician to move. And I was like, okay, you know, it'd be nice to go back home, and I did grew up here, so I do have a lot of fond memories with the area. But um, I finished up law school, and I moved back here while Candy was uh, finishing up her residency up there uh, in Missouri. And when I got down here, I was mostly studying for the bar, uh, which is an absolute nightmare, as you can imagine. <laughs> you can imagine. But, <laughs> so I studied for the bar exam. And after I ended up taking it, I, I was looking for jobs. And I've been looking, and there is a a remarkable shortage of uh, attorney physicians and uh, positions in town but I happened to be looking at the right place on the internet at the time and I saw that they had this position open that Baxter had this position available and I said you know that sounds like an ideal job for a person like me who you know comes from a family with a medical background uh, my prior work at uh, the University of Missouri uh, School of Law was doing VA appeals, so I did a lot of medical record reviews. I had kind of an understanding of what basically healthcare is supposed to be like. I, I was always looking for things that were done wrong or trying to find those sort of things, so I kind of already had a mind uh, geared towards that, and I did have an interest in healthcare in general. So it was kind of a, a wonderful sort of lucky moment there where I said, oh, wow, good. You know, I, I now have this law degree, I have this interest, and oh, look, here's this job that seems to fit me perfectly. And from there, I, you know, applied and went through our rather exhaustive interview process. <laughs> and uh, next thing I know, I got the call and uh, now been here over a year. And it uh, continues to be a challenging but engaging, you know, uh, workplace. So. Well, I know we're extremely lucky to have you, and I know there's RAC and some of the great progress that you've made and appreciate all that you do over there. I know one of the big things and what you do on a daily basis is you deal a lot with patients and their advanced directives. So can we talk to a little bit of, to our viewers out there about what an advanced directive is and, and how, what they need to do? Well, I would love to because that's a, and it's one of those, again, kind of lucky things that just happened um, when I kind of showed up. Nobody said advanced directives are what, you know, they, they, nobody said that falls under my, uh, umbrella. It's just sort of something that I took a keen interest in, in and started pushing for. And mostly because the power of attorney question came up. And, you know, Arkansas has gone kind of back and forth on how they want to call these uh, advanced directives, durable power of attorney for healthcare, uh, healthcare proxy, living will. There's all these different words out there. And back a couple years ago, 2015, 2016, a law came out, the Arkansas Healthcare Decisions Act, that kind of streamlined that a little bit. All of those words are still used, but what it comes down to is an advanced directive is a set of instructions. It's a document that states the wishes of a patient regarding their treatment in the event that they're incapable of making those decisions or incapable of communicating them in any sort of way. A classic example and one that I think could come up is, you know, especially with people our age, we don't really think about advanced directives a whole lot, and I'm going to throw myself under the bus here. I really need to get one done, uh, <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, so basically, it doesn't have to be very formal. There's not a whole lot of requirements regarding you know how it's supposed to be written or anything like that, but what it is is a written set of instructions saying, okay, in the event that I'm incapacitated, I want these kinds of things to be done or I don't want these kinds of things to be done. And I want this person designated over here to be the person who makes healthcare decisions for me in the event that I'm incapacitated. That person's called the agent or, you know, healthcare agent for that person. 
they have to be aware of it, they have to agree to it, and then at the end it has to be signed by two witnesses. And This is the only real requirement to it that's kind of a sticking point, but in the past it used to be harder. In the past it used to be you had to have a notary. And now you still can, if you prefer notaries, um, or if you think it's likely to be challenged by other family members. But otherwise, you really just need two witnesses. And the only requirement on those witnesses is that one of them has to be somebody who's not related to you and is not going to inherit something if you do pass away. So it gets rid of that sort of tinge of personal, uh, personal gain motive there and ensures that those inter you know, what they're actually deciding is in your best interest based on the things that you've said in the past. Now, is an advanced directive absolutely necessary? No. I mean, under Arkansas law, there's all these default settings that you know do make it where even if you didn't have one, we'll do everything we can to try to meet whatever your wishes might be. But we have to do a lot more guesswork, and there's a lot more uh, initial setup to try to figure out who gets to be that person. And this is more likely to be the point where I get called in, is if a patient uh, unconscious, you know, in a comatose state, and he doesn't have any family in the area, uh, doesn't have any real close friends. The only people who know him at all are the mailman and, you know, his next door neighbor three miles away who occasionally checks on his cat. And so, in that case, we still have to find somebody who gets to make that decision, so who's the right person? If you have an advanced directive, we don't have to ask those questions. It's already there. We don't have to say, okay, I don't know how they feel about, you know, life support. I don't know how they feel about, uh, f you know, nutrition and hydration being provided. Having an advanced directive means that all that's already written down. We don't have to ask those questions. Now, if there's something you want to refuse and you're perfectly capable of doing that, then you can refuse treatment anytime you want. But only if you're really conscious to do it. And that's, I think, one of the misunderstandings about advanced directives. People worry that, you know, they're going to end up getting something that they didn't want when they're perfectly capable. It only applies in the event that you're not capable of making decisions for yourself. Gotcha. Well, we're going we're gonna to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk more about uh, some tips on preparing your advanced directive. And um, we'll also get into the social topic um, that uh, seems to be all over social media right now, um, this idea of Arkansas and the medical marijuana law. So stick with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Healthy Connections. Uh, Cameron Lincoln and I were just talking about advanced directives. And Cameron, do you have any tips out there for um, somebody preparing their advanced directive? Sure. Uh, the easiest way nowadays is Baxter Regional actually has advanced directives that are available for you to fill out. They're in a trifold, or actually I think it's quadfold brochure format, and it's easy to follow along. You simply select things, check in the box style um, that you want, and it has a spot for designating your agent, it has a spot for the witnessing signatures and all of that. So for people who don't have very difficult things that they want to put in there that can be helped with very standardized uh, Things for people who don't really have very complicated uh, requests, that's a great way to go. If you have more specific uh, requirements or something sort of more detailed that you want to do, put in a lot of if then statements. Uh, so if so and so is not available, then this person. And if you want to get really complex with it, then your best options are either writing one yourself, which you can do. Or hiring, of course, one of the many attorneys uh, who are out there who would be able to do that. Um, they're probably going to refer to it as a durable power of attorney for health care because I think uh, many of the attorneys, that's just the language they're more familiar with. And in a lot of ways, it will probably be more robust. And they may even combine it with a durable power of attorney in general, which deals with other things like financial and property management, things like that. And I really feel like we should emphasize the difference because sometimes excuse me, sometimes I'll see a uh, durable power of attorney that's a general one, and it covers all those financial things, but nowhere on there does it say anything about health care. And under the current law, that's not, uh, it's not good enough uh, for health care. You need something that actually specifically delegates health care decisions. So. That makes sense. You know, you don't want to leave that burden on your loved ones um, in your time of need. So address yeah. that. Again, you can get those um, at the hospital for it's more complex, like Cameron was saying, uh, see your local attorney. Um, so Cameron, I want to get to this because this is extremely um, social topic right now sure. with um, 
the last election, Arkansas passing the medical marijuana law. Um, mm -hmm. I know that you've been been filling a bunch of questions and stuff on this. So um, can you explain that to our viewers? So this is definitely a subject I've been spending a lot of time on. Um, it's actually a amendment. It was medical or it was constitutional amendment 98. It was added to the Arkansas Constitution that said that we had to form all these laws and basically a program for having medical marijuana in the state of Arkansas. And I, I'm sure most of us remember kind of the, well, the stress of the ballot that particular season, but that uh, passed and here we are. So in the time frame since then, a lot of law has been passed in the state of Arkansas dealing with how they're going to manage that program. And at the moment, not much is happening there because I'm sure you've probably heard, but the initial requirements for setting up a dispensary or setting up a cultivation center are not exactly easy to fulfill. There's a pretty high uh, cost uh, initially, there's a certain amount of net, uh, well, liquid, basically funds that you have to have available assets before you could possibly start running one of those. Um, and they've pretty much created a start to finish system for the production of and then eventual delivery of marijuana in the state of Arkansas. And it is quite heavily regulated. I was actually pretty surprised. It's a, it's a top-notch uh, machine that they've got set up here. But the idea is that you know, we're not just, it's not just somebody growing it out in their backyard. You have basically an industrialized farm uh, for a cultivation center. There are rules for how much of the product has to be tested for concentrations of THC and cannabidiol, which are the two ingredients in medical marijuana that have some sort of effect. Um, interestingly enough, those two have different effects, but cannabidiol has been in certain cases isolated by itself and it's its own kind of medication. It's very good for the, uh, they say it's good for the seizures and things like that. I'm not a medical professional, I don't know, <laughs> but that's the claim. Um, so on the cultivation center side, they've got product testing throughout. They take a certain amount of the, uh, the batch, the lot, if you will, and they'll test that and they'll run concentrations. It has to be labeled. There will only be a limited number of dispensaries can't remember six or seven I think I think it's six for the state of Arkansas and those are the only people who can distribute it they're the only place you can go to get it physicians are not prescribing because prescribing uh, is done through the DEA and of course the federal government has not as yet seen fit to consider this legal so there's kind of a tension uh, kind of a federalism states rights uh, issue setting up here which will be interesting to watch. Um, I do know that as of uh, right this moment, there are two bills. Um, it's actually the same bill, but it's currently in both the uh, House of Representatives and the Senate up in uh, Washington, D.C. And these bills are called the Carers Act. And the idea there is that they're going to try to limit the federal government's ability to enforce uh, federal drug laws regarding marijuana in states where we have a state supplied medical marijuana bill. So for instance, in Arkansas, if you were using medical marijuana that under this federal law that's being proposed, uh, you wouldn't be at any risk of enforcement there from the DEA because you're complying with state laws. And it essentially is a federalism type bill that's designed to give the power to the states to make that decision. Um, as for getting medical marijuana, uh, that's gonna require that you have one of the list of conditions that have been authorized for that. Your physician or a physician, preferably I would imagine your family one, um, but maybe not, uh, they will certify that you have that condition. There's no recommendation portion. Originally when this came out, physicians had to recommend it or say that marijuana would be correct in this instance. That's been removed. So it's kind of taken that onus off of the physician. They don't have to necessarily tacitly support um, the law does not require physicians to do it. It's up to a physician's personal discretion whether or not they're going to uh, do these certification forms. But the certification is absolutely necessary for you to go to a dispensary to get it. Now, it plays with other laws quite a bit. Um, for instance, there's concealed carry. You can't have a concealed carry if you're on medical marijuana. I saw this past week, uh, and maybe before that, but I saw it this past week, 
that the DUI and DWI laws in Arkansas now contain provisions for a certain amount of marijuana in a person's system, THC, I believe it's five nanograms, which is very small. Um, so there is some concern that being on medical marijuana will limit some of the activities you can engage in. You can't smoke it in public. You can't smoke it on a hospital property at all under Arkansas law. Um, if you're using edibles, that may be different. If you're using oils and tinctures, that may be different. So there's all these different aspects of the law that kind of stretch into everything. What I do know is as of right now, there aren't any operating dispensaries. So it's going to be a while before any of this stuff starts making it into the daily lives. And I expect that there will be more laws and regulations in Arkansas made over the next year or so trying to come to grips with all the different aspects it touches. So. From the hospital perspective, are hospitals kind of waiting to see how all the rules and regulations flush out before they move? Hmm. Um, I can't really speak to that. Um, I know I've reached out and, and tried to get a little more information from other groups, but you know, I, I think we're all kind of moving forward with this. I'm still waiting on responses from some, but I imagine it is very high on the list of things that uh, other hospitals in the state are dealing with or trying to you know, prepare for, because it's new and it's fresh and there is a lot of uncertainty, I think, in how that plays with federal law. Because um, you know, every hospital, I, I would imagine, has some sort of concern about federal law. Um, and you know, the, the risk there is there to some of the programs that we're all engaged in. So I, I think it, it's understandable that there is some concern and that we we're kind of all looking at that. And as of right now, I mean, I, I can't speak to what sort of policies are being developed at other institutions or even at our own. And I also can't say whether a particular physician is going to choose to be involved in the program or not, because again, that's up to their own kind it's of their discretion. Choice, yeah. I do believe it's unlikely that a hospital, well, I mean, we can't dispense it. The only people who can dispense are uh, dispensaries. So I think there will be some difficulty in figuring out how uh, you can continue your medication if you happen to be in the hospital and have a medical marijuana uh, prescription. I think uh, there are a lot of questions to be kind of delved into there. Some concerns, I mean, pharmacists really aren't supposed to touch it. Nurses aren't supposed to touch it. So it does raise some interesting questions that we're going to have to try to find answers to. Well, it sounds like you have your work cut out for you. <laughs> <laughs> Never a dull moment. That's right. Yeah. Well, Cameron, I appreciate you spending time with us today. I think this has been extremely beneficial for our viewers at home to understand kind of the ins and outs of that. And, and right now, you know, we've filled a lot of questions from the public relations side of things, too. And right now, my answer is we don't, we don't know. We, we don't, don't know. know yet. And, and when, whenever we know, we'll let the public know. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, <laughs> as so, best we can. As best we can. Yeah. But um, thank you for explaining, uh, you know, what uh, compliance and risk management is all about and being with us today. We really appreciate it. And um, well, thanks for having me. It's, yeah. uh, it's always a pleasure. Of course. So. And uh, thank you for viewers at home for joining the show. And um, we will see you next week.